Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to my presentation. Um, let me just share my screen. Hello, everyone. I'm Di Kong, a postdoctoral research fellow at AMU. So today I'd like to present my recent study that heavily relies on SIMS characterization. The topic of my work is application of SIMS in solar PV research, the role of hydrogen in crystalline silicon solar cells. So, um, photovoltaic technology converts sunlight directly into electricity. We often see PV arrays connected by solar modules on rooftops. Um, or in solar power plants. So nowadays, above 90% of uh, solar modules are made from crystalline silicon solar cells. Well, the output of solar modules is determined by the conversion efficiency of solar cells. And for solar cells, surface recombination is one of the key factors limiting the performance. The research, uh, the surface recombination is mainly caused by the dangling bonds at the surface of silicon wafers. And J0 is the recombination uh, current density parameter, which is generally used to indicate the quality of surface passivation. A high J0 value suggests that the surface recombination is high or the surface passivation is low. To improve the surface passivation, we commonly deposit passivation layers such as oxide, uh, silicon oxide, silicon nitride, or amorphous silicon films directly on the silicon wafers. And in recent years, solar cell structures with doped polysilicon on the ultra thin one to two nanometer oxide have been widely applied due to the efficient surface passivation provided by the thin oxide, and also the field effect passivation given by the top poly. In addition, it is widely agreed that an additional hydrogen treatment to add hydrogen into the polysilicon uh, silicon oxide passivating contacts can further improve the surface passivation. And hydrogenation is commonly realized by thermal anneal in forming gas Reposition of dielectric, cutting, uh, dielectric films like silicon nitride, uh, aluminum oxide, or a stack of alox and nitride, followed by a thermal anneal to release the hydrogen from the dielectric film to the silicon vapor. Also, commercial solar cells with polysilicon passivating contacts, an excellent solar cell efficiency of 25.53 has been. A uh, reported by Jinko Solar on this N-type beneficial solar cell structure. So the main fabrication process includes the growth of thin oxide, deposition of intrinsic uh, polysilicon films, doping by phosphorus diffusion, um, creation of P plus layer, and deposition of dielectric films. Also screen printing uh, metallization, followed by the high temperature firing. Well, for uh, the high temperature firing is compulsory for commercial solar cells to form metal contacts, while at the same time inject hydrogen into the polysilicon uh, passive contacts. Well, such solar cells have an average efficiency of only 23%. And these could be potentially due to the firing impact on uh, N plus polysilicon and hydrogen could play a role as reported in our previous work. After firing at temperatures at or above 800 degrees, the uh, polysilicon passivating contacts can degrade severely. You can see that after firing, the general value increased clearly, uh, significantly. Um, for further investigation, in this work, we apply SIMS to uh, measure hydrogen content in the polysilicon passivated samples and then correlate measured hydrogen to the JNOP value. As given in the literature, SIMS is an effective tool for hydrogen measurement in such samples. We are particularly interested in the hydrogen surrounding the uh, thin oxide 
which determines the surface passivation quality of polysilicon passivating contacts. So this slide uh, shows hydrogen profiles in polysilicon silicon oxide stacks measured by SIMS. After phosphorus diffusion, uh, as shown in the gray curve, no obvious hydrogen peaks were detected. Well, after nitride deposition, the black curve, there was a small hydrogen peak surrounding the thin oxide. And after firing at 800 degrees, we found a significant increase in the hydrogen content around the oxide. And the J0 also increased. This is quite surprising as we expect that the injection of hydrogen normally leads to improved surface passivation. After firing, we performed subsequent treatments to add more hydrogen. And this was achieved by uh, HFDEEP to remove the fire the nitrate films, followed by nitrate abscission and then forming gas anneal. Interestingly, adding more hydrogen caused a further degradation in the passivation quality. In addition, we removed the hydrogen from the fired poly by uh, 300 degree annealing after removing the fired nitrate films. And after one minute nitrogen nitro anneal, the hydrogen content near the oxide reduced. You can see it changes from the red one to the blue one. And the J0 degraded. Now the degraded J0 was recovered. And after an additional seven minute meal, the hydrogen level further reduced and the J0 degraded again. So next, we also measured hydrogen in samples fired at different temperatures. The hydrogen content near the oxide increases with the firing temperature most likely due to that the nitride releases more hydrogen upon a, uh, upon a higher temperature thermal anneal. And then seams measurements were performed on samples fired, at, uh, fired with various dielectric cutting layers at the same temperature, showing distinct hydrogen profiles. So for samples with very low hydrogen content after firing, the general values are quite high. For samples with slightly more hydrogen, improved hydrogen, uh, improved J0 was observed. Among these five samples, the sample with the highest hydrogen concentration has a poor surface passivation. The overall results in this slide suggest that the dielectric capping layers act as a hydrogen source upon firing, injecting hydrogen into the polysilicon silicon oxide passivating contacts. And to draw a clearer correlation between the hydrogen content around the oxide and the J0, we converted raw SIMS data of hydrogen counts into hydrogen concentration for all the five samples that were used for SIMS measurements, integrated um, the hydrogen plot and calculated the area under the, the oxide layer to reflect their hydrogen density near the interfacial oxide. And the results are shown in this graph. So the general trend is that insufficient hydrogen results in poor surface passivation after firing. As the hydrogen density increases, the J0 can be improved. And after reaching an optimum amount of hydrogen, an excellent surface passivation is achieved. But for samples with excess hydrogen near the oxide, the J0 value starts to increase with hydrogen density. The presence of too much hydrogen is also supported by the following observations. For the sample with too much hydrogen after firing, adding additional hydrogen can lead to further surface, degrad surface degradation, whereas degraded genot can be fully recovered by releasing additional hydrogen. Uh, by releasing the, uh, by removing the excess hydrogen. And the literature has also shown that hydrogen itself could cause recombination, potentially resulting in reduction in the carrier lifetime, which could be a 
possible explanation here. Well, in addition to hydrogen or deuterium, the researchers in our group have also applied seams to measure fluorine, phosphorus, and iron. Our results, our, um, our recent study has indicated that fluorine could potentially replace hydrogen to passivate dangling bonds and improve surface passivation. The previous results have shown that surface passivation can change with the diffusion of hydrogen, leading to unstable performance during thermal treatment. Well, the use of fluorine might help to enhance the stability of silicon solar cells. And we are performing more experimental work for further study. And the results here shows the um, seems profiles for fluorine. And the red one shows the sample with fluorine, and the, well, the black one shows the sample without fluorine. And in this slide, the sample was scattered by phosphorus diffusion, which is expected to remove the metal impurities, particularly iron. So the seams data clearly indicate the distribution of phosphorus and iron. Um, comparing the red and blue curves, we can find that iron can be detected in non gated control sample, which is the red one. There's no iron impurities can be observed after gathering, as shown in the blue curve. And the results confirm that the phosphorus diffusion indeed removed the iron contamination. So in conclusion, we observed that hydrogen concentration around the oxide uh, corresponds to the general value in samples after firing. Upon firing, the dielectric, uh, dielectric coating films release hydrogen into the polysilicon silicon oxide stack. Uh, our results suggest that an optimum hydrogen surrounding the uh, oxide provides an excellent drain out after firing, while well, excess or insufficient hydrogen can both lead to surface degradation after firing. And seems is a very useful characterization tool for solar PV research, as shown in our work. And more seams measurements are required for our future work. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Di, for your presentation. It was great. Okay. So, uh, my name, is, for those who were not at the beginning, so my name is uh, Paula Perez. Uh, I am the SIMS application manager at Chemica, and I will handle the Q&A session. Uh, my colleague, Rong Yu, is also joining us. He's a SIMS expert scientist, uh, and in the past he has worked at ANU with the D, uh, and nowadays he's working at Chemica. So we will answer questions if the questions are more related to the SIMS technique or to the instrumentation. Um, so let me check. Uh, so for now, we don't have any question, but so don't hesitate to ask questions either in Paula, the Paula, there is one question. Yes. Not in the Q&A, but there's a question from Dieter Ischheim. Oh, yeah, in the chat. Yeah. So I will read it. Is, is hydrogen more bound to the dangling bonds as shown on one of the first slides, or does it seem more uniformly distributed through the silicon oxide layer? Yep. Um, <clears throat> sorry, thank you for the question. Um, this is a really good question. Actually, the hydrogen like distribution with the silicon oxide layer is not very um, well understood yet because the oxide is just so thin and due to the limitation of seams it's um, very difficult to identify whether it's uniformly distributed through the oxide layer and also if Ron has anything to add up feel free to ask yeah, so, so you can, uh, this is answer your question, Peter. So you can uh, ask your questions in the Q&A, uh, but you can also raise your hand and I will let you speak. Uh, what, 
We have a question from uh, Patty. Uh, which SIMS machine was used for the analysis and what was the optimum setup? Uh, so maybe wrong, you can answer this question. Uh, five, Kameka IMS 5F E7. And then the, the nearly same as the 7F, the electronics. And then and the machine itself is a 5F. And then the, we mostly, we want to get the improve the depth resolution. Normally we're using the MCS. So using the secondary is the positive and the primary is season. So we can get the low energy impact energy. So improve the depth resolution. Does this answer your question, Pratik? Thank you. So if you, if you have any other question, you can type in in the Q&A or you can raise your hand and I will let you speak. While we wait for, for the next, next question, I, I have a question from my side. Uh, the, uh, to, to what extent uh, can uh, hydrogenation improve uh, solar cell performance? Sorry. According to the literature, um, hydrogenation can <clears throat> improve the solar cell efficiency by 1% absolute. So that's pretty um, important for silicon solar cells. Okay. It's uh, encouraging. Um, so for, uh, I also have an, another question while we wait, uh, and maybe there will be other questions after. Um, are there any other tools that can be used to detect hydrogen in silicon solar cells? And what are the advantages and disadvantages compared to SIMS? Yeah, um, so at the moment, uh, for our researchers, we, we have seen people using uh, atom probe tomography, uh, nuclear reaction analysis, and also sometimes we use photo transform infrared uh, spectroscopy. Uh, but I'm, personally, I'm not very familiar with atom probe to uh, tomography and nuclear reaction analysis, but I've seen people using it. They normally use it to um, support the, the observations or the characterization results measured by some other tools. Not um, like they don't usually show the results in, uh, independently. Uh, and for Fourier transform infrared spectral uh, scopy, that's optimum uh, characterization. So the results can be impacted strongly by the surface condition and also the like vacuum condition and humid in the air. So it's not very um, reliable, I would say, but we also use that as an indication to, um, to, to identify whether there are any hydrogen or not. Okay. Thank you very much. Carla, we have a question from Stephen Harvey, not in the, the Q&A, but in the chat. So what temperature was the nitrogen anneal performed at? You showed data with different nitrogen anneal times. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. The nitrogen anneal was performed at 300 degrees. And yes, we indeed varied the nitrogen anneal times, but the temperature was fixed. If I have time, I can answer a little bit, uh, add more about the atom probe. So atom probe compared to scenes uh, is, uh, we can get a very, very nano meter later resolution and uh, the depth resolution. So this is a very good technology. So is uh, for the hydrogen analyzer is also is more difficult because uh, due to the vacuum have the background. So is the detail limits uh, compared to the uh, seems a little bit uh, poor, the atom probe. So for the other elements uh, is uh, is very good. So uh, uh, a very difficult. You sometimes you cannot if the hydrogen concentration is too low. So immediately you 
don't know this is uh, coming from the background or from the, your material. So I know some group uh, is uh, very interesting, like in metal. So they can using the deterrent as a tracer. You can top in in the, your sample to show the, the hydrogen there and then using atom probe. So you can uh, distinguish this is coming from the background, from the vacuum or from your sample. So it's not a directory to measure hydrogen, I know. Also the, for the sample preparation, so for the uh, atom probe is very hard. You need a focus eye beam to cut the, the tip. So maybe not a very 100% the tip successful. It's very well for, for the atom probe. Also the analyze one sample is very time consuming. They can go to the 10 hour, maybe uh, uh, 16 hour for one sample. So later uh, they can get a, a lot of the, the 3D destructure of your uh, the sample. So the, a lot of the big data, the, the data, so you need uh, using other software to reconstruction your uh, interesting elements in your, your sample. This is uh, what I, I know. Thank you, Rang, for, for the explanation, mm -hmm. because I don't think many people know, maybe not everyone will know uh, Atom Probe. So it's a good insight. Yeah. Uh, Katie uh, has a question uh, with regards to the hydrogen detection. Have you considered the effect of hydrogen in the vacuum system? Are there any concerns about the origin of the hydrogen you are detecting? That is, that it's not all from the sample and some is from the vacuum system. Maybe this is for, for Rong, who has performed the measurements. Yeah, so it's a... Uh... In principle, the vacuum is uh, affect the, the hydrogen detect uh, limit, so it's a very sensitive. So in that case, we normally we will put the sample in the airlock like uh, on the Friday evening, and then the whole weekend we can pumping. We can um, in the mid chamber we can like uh, baking a little bit, and then the, on Monday we can put the liquid nitrogen. So for uh, one or two hour, and then improve vacuum. So in that case, we can very get a very good uh, detail limit. Yes, in fact, uh, we, we know that the vacuum affects the detection limit. Um, but um, so these measurements have been done as, as he explained in the in the presentation on a 5F uh, with 7F electronics. So it's a 7F yeah. like instrument. And uh, it's a very, um, it's a well, well suited instrument for, for detecting light elements. Uh, because yep. we, we have a small analysis chamber and uh, uh, we can reach very good uh, uh, vacuum level in the analysis chamber. So there is uh, a few other questions. Uh, Namita uh, asked, what would be the temperature for forming gas anneal for optimum hydrogen content in the study? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, the optimum hydrogen content or the forming gas anneal for optimum hydrogenation is actually de uh, that is dependent on the doping types, like multiple parameters. So generally for us, we do forming gas anneal at 400 degrees or 450. But for example, for N-type polysilicon, the 400 degree forming gas anneal can reach really good um, like optimum hydrogen content already, but for P-type uh, polysilicon, we have to use either um, allox or allox with a post anneal to imp further improve the hydrogen. Um, so yeah, it really depends on what type of cells you have. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, someone has raised your hand, but I'll just uh, first read uh, another question, which is in the Q&A. Why is too much hydrogen a problem for efficiency? Yeah, thank you. That's, this is a really good question. Actually, um, this had the too much hydrogen problem has been shown by multiple uh, researchers, but not like many of them have shown very clear evidence and um, we now just um, hypothesize that the hydrogen itself is just the like kind of defect that can cause recombination. Um, 
that's one of the possibilities. Um, for like high, too much hydrogen can also cause many other problems, such as the um, platelets, uh, some charging issues. So it's not very sure yet, but in general, we suspect that it's just a defect. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, thank you. Uh, from the hydrogen content, we can measure from FTIR also, even from SIMS also. So basically, how much error of the hydrogen content uh, we can expect from the both measurements? Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, FTIR is, as you know, it's opti uh, optical measurement, and it can be strongly affected by multiple routes factors like the surface, the uh, vacuum. Um, so, and also the FTIR results should be analyzed based on the position of the signals or the, the wavelength. Sometimes that also depends on the processing conditions. So it, in general, the, the analysis of the FTIR results is a bit complicated and it's really difficult to get uh, a good quantitative results or um, using FTIR. So, but for SIMS, it can be quite um, accurate, I would say. And also FTIR doesn't seem to give you the depth profile like mm -hmm. what SIMS does. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Thank you. We, we have uh, another question in the Q&A um, from uh, Vincent. You correlated the content with the complete age content in the polysilicon and silicon oxide stack. Why didn't you take the age content at the oxide interface only? Oh, um, this is because the oxide thin oxide itself that only has a thickness of one to two nanometer. And it's really difficult to know how much hydrogen is within the oxide and how much oxide, how much hydrogen is around the oxide. So in general, we need to know if we want to know the like exact amount of hydrogen, we need to do a say estimation using um, like including both hydrogen around the oxide and also within the oxide. And also you might know that um, there's a smearing issue as well for seams. So when, when we see the peak and the, the data starts to steep down, it doesn't mean that there's that's the point when hydrogen, uh, that's the, 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 the position that no hydrogen at all. So that's why we just integrate the, the whole, like um, a thicker layer for the hydrogen estimation. Thank you, Lee. This I is- can add a, one more, uh, add a, some comments on, on this point. So the, in that case, uh, we measure seems we can uh, measure the cesium negative mode, direct measure hydrogen. So in that case, we want to quantify a mole uh, easily. So we're using the MCS technology. So it means uh, we measure secondary ions is also the positive. So in that uh, method, uh, give a, a good, uh, less uh, the, 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 the metric effects. So it's a more the uh, proportion to your concentration to the hydrogen. So also in that case, the uh, energy, the impact energy is less, so we, we can get a good uh, depth resolution. So this is for hydrogen. Thank you, Rong. So let me check <clears throat> if someone else has raised his or her hand. No, it seems to... Um, uh, D, we already mentioned about uh, FTIR IR to measure hydrogen. 
Uh, are there any other tools that can be used to detect hydrogen in silicon solar cells? And what are the yeah, advantages uh, compared to SIMS? Sure. Um, there are a few researchers have tried um, atom probe tomography and nuclear reaction analysis. But personally, I'm not very familiar with these tools. Maybe Ron can explain them a bit. So for the normal A, for the neutron scatter can measure the hydrogen. So it's a, for most uh, cases, it's a difficult to booking the system. So you need a very long time waiting. Uh, also, the sometimes you get a spectrum, you need uh, others, uh, the, the serials to, 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 to get the, how say it, uh, to fitting the, your data. And then the data limits is uh, compared, the seems that is uh, not good enough. And uh, another method. Uh, uh, we mentioned atom probe. FPI, yeah, atom probe probe uh, is a uh, late resolution and uh, depth resolution is uh, good compared to the seams. So they can reach uh, atom uh, layer the resolution. So the, the problem is the sample preparation is uh, very hard. You need a focus eye beam to cut the tip. Also for the hydrogen in the atom probe, still the vacuum is a big problem. So the background is very high due to the detail limits is not good enough. Sometimes it's very difficult to, to get the hydrogen signal to you can confirm this is coming from the sample. So in that case, I know the in German or Switzerland a group, so they need the deuterium as a tracer. So to, to doping in your sample and then, and then to measure an atom probe, so you can confirm that uh, this is uh, from the sample itself, not uh, from the uh, background from the hydrogen, uh, the vacuum. Also, the like uh, ATP, the uh, analyze time, very time consuming. Analyze one sample, maybe you need a uh, 16 hour, nearly 20 hour. Then you can get uh, the, a lot of data and then using the software to reconstruct uh, 3D. The result is uh, not very convenient, very time consuming to get the data and get the uh, useful the information compared to SIMS. Thank you, Rong, for the explanation. We have another question from Katie. Yes. Have you, uh, so the question is, have you compared your hydrogen concentrations in the SIMS with the thermal desorption spectroscopy? Yes. Thank you, Katie. Unfortunately, I don't know what TDS is. Uh, so no, I haven't. So I'm not sure is uh, the TDS uh, maybe cannot do the depth of profiling. So, so I don't think so if the, the TDS can do the depth of profiling look like the seams. So maybe you can get as uh, the average in the bulk. So this is maybe and no meaning for, for our case. So for Hello, safety, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, you can't get the depth profile information. I just thought if you were integrating your hydrogen counts from the SIMS, you'd get a value of your concentration in the bulk, which you can then compare with thermal desorption spectroscopy. Um, it, it was just because um, you were discussing about alternative methods, methods to measure hydrogen, that, that that's one that can do it as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. I think that's a good uh, good suggestion. We will definitely think about it. Thank you. It's, it's complicated to interpret, and I don't think it's very well established the field in terms of knowing where all your peaks originate from, but it may give you an indication of how the hydrogen is bonded as well. You might get multiple peaks um, mm. in, your, in your TDS, and you may see that there is different ways that the hydrogen is bonded and kind of trapped inside your material as well with, with TDS. Yeah, I think this TDS is somehow similar to FTIR, what I just mentioned before. They give just a lot of peaks and you know how the hydrogen bound with other, for example, silicon or oxygen or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not quite so clear as FTIR mm. where you know what the bonds are. You might get three mm. multiple peaks and you kind of have to work out which one might okay. be bonded to hydrogen, which one may be just in, in silicon. Um, mm. And so it, yeah, it requires a bit of effort and your sample will, you know, you need a big bulky sample and it will be destroyed because you have to heat it up to very high temperatures. Um, but yeah, just wondered if it was something you might want to consider. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. So for this case, I think the seems uh, is, uh, is I think is the best uh, the method because in the silicon oxide is very thin. So just a few the atom layer. Also the the detail limit is is a poor. So in that case, you need to get a, a useful information. So a lot of cases like uh, nitrogen and the fluorine in the silicon oxide is a, a few layer. It's very hard using other technique because uh, for the nitrogen also the, the yield is very poor. So the seems uh, for this kind of case, uh, seems is very good, uh, very sensitivity. Also, you can get a uh, very good uh, depth resolution. This is very important things. Then you can get uh, the, the useful information. So like a different uh, annealing temperature, so how much you can accumulate on the interface. So under the curve, so you can, you can uh, integrate uh, how much so you can get. Also with the silicon, we can have some uh, uh, polysilicon, we have some uh, hydrogen in the, uh, this kind of implantation the standard. So we can measure the standard. So you can get uh, the uh, RSF, the relative sensitive factor. So you can quantify the concentration from the, your signal, the counts transfer to the concentration. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. 